What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Sam's Report. Today is February 9th, and uh, we are rocking and rolling our way through the Q1 of the year, although I think it's, what, Microsoft's Q3. And, uh, yeah, good stuff, good timing, and we are heading deep into Redstone 4 territory, which is uh, always an exciting time. Always an exciting time. Um, if you missed it earlier this week, I got my hands on one of, I don't know if it's still charged or not. Let's see here. It is. I think it vibrated like it was going to turn on. <laughs> or maybe it's not. Well, uh, the battery might be dead. This is the Xbox Watch. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, I did a video on this. Just look on this channel. And there's also a link uh, in that post to the write-up. I don't know why it won't turn on. I'm, oh, there we go. There, it's booting. The battery life on this thing is not great. But, um, yeah. So I got my hands on one of these, did a full write-up video on its own. So go definitely go check that out if that type of thing interests you, because the more I play with this thing, the sadder I get that Microsoft didn't actually launch the band in this uh, variety, because I think it's superior than what the old band was, personally speaking. But um, anyways, uh, what's going on in the world of Microsoft this week? They, they dumped out a new build. Um, they had a lot of internal meetings this week about lining up uh, what's going to be in Redstone 5. Um, I think there's some more changes coming to the Windows org here sometime before June 30th, which if you're not familiar, June 30th is fiscal year end for Microsoft. So if they make big changes, it's typically kind of uh, in the run up to that time. And so that those sort of things are happening. And um, Apple's releasing the HomePod today, which I'm, I'm sure there's just tens and tens of people around the world super excited. Actually, I know there's going to be people very excited about it for whatever reason um, that they didn't go the Sonos route or the Google route or whatever. If, you know, if that's your thing, great. I'm definitely not buying one because I'm way too deep into the Sonos world. Um, Google's doing some interesting stuff with uh, Google Cloud and their G Drive and making it easier to work with Office. Just an overall interesting week of tech. But um, let's just kind of dive in here, shall we? So this week, uh, Microsoft in LinkedIn's world released Resume Assistant, which if you're not familiar with that, you're not you're not missing too much. But basically, this is a tie-in for Microsoft's $26.2 billion acquisition of LinkedIn. If you're making a resume in Word, there's now an assistant that can help you pull contextually aware information and help you write a better resume. Now, the only problem with that is that if everybody's using Resume Assistant, then everybody's resume is going to look very similar. And as we all know, if you want to get a job, uh, there's two, two primary things if you're trying trying to land a job. It's uh, one, having a creative and unique and different and one, a resume that stands out. If you're using the same tool that everybody else is, um, you may not be standing out. I'm not saying it's a bad tool, but just keep that in mind. And two, it's about connections. So uh, obviously LinkedIn can help you get connections, but having a friend, you know, drop your resume off on the HR desk is a lot bigger than you just mailing it in on your own. But um, that is now out. And um, what other what other fun things are happening? That's kind of like the only one that that kind of caught my eye, but um, there's a couple things in the, in the enterprise world. System Center is now shifting to a semi-annual release, and version 18.1801 is now available. If that makes sense to you, you can go out and grab that, although I suspect most people typically may not upgrade uh, to that type of thing right away. But um, yeah, so we got that going on. So I, I want to dive in here to uh, what happened last Saturday. Last Saturday, I woke up to a very pleasant email in my inbox that was a, a dump of Microsoft internal documents. And um, I still got some more work to do to just dig through some of this content. But one of the things that came out, and I, I wrote like 4,000 words before noon last Saturday, is that uh, Windows 10 S is dead. Um, it's dead. And so there's people justifying and saying this makes sense or whatever. It, it's fine. I, this is a very logical and re reasonable maneuver for Microsoft. Essentially what they're doing is they're making an S mode for every iteration of Windows 10, which is fine. And basically that's what they should have been doing from the first time. But this goes back to the sloppiness of the Windows org and the Microsoft communication. It, it's like this is how this product should have been launched, but they didn't do it. And so anyways, here we are. And they're kind of backtracking, but kind of not. Um, whatever it is, it's fine. But basically, in a nutshell, what you get is if you have Windows 10 Home, you can run then run Windows 10 Home in S mode. Now, we don't really know too much about the transitions between back and forth modes. For example, if you're running Home, can you just spin up S mode? Uh, we don't we don't quite know that yet. What we do know is that if you're going from Home S mode to Home, there's no charge. The only time you're going to get charged from up upgrading or unlocking S mode to the full proper is if you're on Windows 10 Pro S mode and you want to go back to Windows 10 Pro, then it is a $49 fee, which I believe you can get through the Windows Store and it'll unlock it. It's basically you're just buying a new uh, license is what you're doing. But um, S mode will be a part of every shipping SKU. It'll be available to home, education, enterprise, pro users. Microsoft is just wrapping this all into Windows and it's in one hand, it's streamlining their SKUs. But on the other hand, it can also kind of dilute it if you're not sure you're in S mode or not. 
I'm sure that they're going to come out and clarify this. I kind of hope that they will. But as of right now, based on the documentation, which I'm very confident it is accurate, that is the plan going forward, starting with Redstone 4. And I wrote up a bunch of this stuff uh, last Saturday. But just keep in mind that if you're running Windows 10 S today, you're, I believe you're just going to get upgraded um, for free, which you already are. And we know that this is actually happening too, by the way. If you remember maybe two weeks ago or whatever, I was talking on this podcast about how some people who are running Windows 10 S on the Insider we're suddenly on Windows 10 Pro, and it was like, what the hell is happening? Well, I believe that's when they made the internal shift that's saying, hey, Windows 10 S is going away, and that the SKUs were just getting upgraded into an S mode type thing, rather than the full proper Windows 10 Pro, and it was just kind of a, again, uh, the confusion and communication from Microsoft, not always the clearest thing, and sometimes we have to fumble through this until we get internal documentation that actually clarifies what is going on. But... Keep that in mind that Windows 10 S is dead, but long live uh, Windows 10 S mode. And I'm actually very excited about this because this kind of ties into the bigger Microsoft narrative that we have going on here. And the reason why I titled this one uh, Bold Move is for two, this podcast Bold Move is for two specific things. Uh, one is uh, pretty obvious here. Microsoft is going all in on PWAs. Now, uh, it, I've argued it on Twitter. I've argued it everywhere else. I believe that UWP is dead. Um it, People seem to think that this is a bad take and that this isn't accurate. But you know what? This is the most logical thing in the world for Microsoft. And I am very bullish on this. This is a very... I can't explain how high of a level I think that this is a good thing for Microsoft at the end of the day. Yes, UWP had this great vision of write once, run anywhere, but then that dream never materialized because mobile never materialized. Nobody's really writing apps for Xbox. Um, even Spotify, one of the largest apps that's used on the Xbox based on what somebody told me at Microsoft, uh, is not a UWP. They wrote a, a specific application for that Xbox and it's different from the desktop. On that, they also remember they built these bridges. Remember, you can you can take your old Win32 app and you can run it through a bridge, a converter, and put it in the store. That's not a UWP either. And and I want to be really, really, really clear. When I say UWP is going away, I don't mean the Windows Store is failing. Um, I, I actually think the Windows Store is going to get stronger here. I just think that that framework doesn't make so much more much sense going forward as it did maybe say two years ago. And so here's my justification for that. If you're building a, an app for Windows 10, if you're building an app for Windows 10, and it's only going to run on Windows 10, why would you put it into a UWP? Why not write Win32 and then run it through a converter and put it in the store? You're going to get better performance. You're going to get, if you're running true Win32, that's the most powerful version of a Windows app um, it could ever be. And if you're writing a store app, which means that you inherently, by that nature of writing a store app, need less uh, less API access within Windows 10. A PWA makes a hell of a lot more sense. It really does because you can write one PWA and it will eventually work on iOS. It'll work on, I believe it works on uh, Android natively as of right now. PWA is the truly write once, run everywhere. And yes, I know that there are some minor advantages to writing a true UWP. They're a little bit more powerful in PWA and somebody's going to call in and say, hey, a PWA really is just a UWP. Yes, because that's because what Microsoft is doing to PWAs in the store. They're forcing it into that container. It's not the developer goes and writes a PWA or and then turns it himself into a UWP. That's what Microsoft is doing. Keep that in mind. There, that's a big difference because if a developer goes and writes a PWA, it will now show up in the Windows Store. It could also run on any other platform. And this, you guys, this is how Microsoft, in my opinion, eventually one day could get back into the mobile space. And actually, the the Andromeda device that we all talk about, the split screen device, I believe is going to be a PWA powerhouse because that is how Microsoft is planning on getting back into this the app space. Because if Twitter goes to PWA, if every major app developer goes to PWA, Microsoft's app problems are solved. That gap goes away. Microsoft is pushing people towards PWAs. I believe Google is going to make that step here in the very near future of pushing people towards PWAs. And I think Apple will eventually get there as well. Now, you could argue that everybody going to PWAs, maybe you don't need Windows as much. I could, I can see that argument, but you can also say that, hey, it makes it a hell of a lot easier to jump from Android to iOS and iOS to Android in some respects. But at the end of the day, I think this is a, an extremely good thing for Microsoft, and this is going to allow them to not have to worry so much about the breadth and quality of their store because people are going to start building PWAs because that is the platform of the future. It reduces development time, and it just makes so much freaking sense that you'd be dumb not to. Now, 
I'm very optimistic about this because this is how a Windows phone, not that I think Microsoft is going to go build a new phone or something like that again, but this is how Microsoft could eventually get back into the space, how it could survive, how it could deal with missing out on mobiles could be coming through PWA. It is not a, uh, you know, a keystone of the arch type thing, but it is a giant step forward if Microsoft can help propel PWAs into the rightful um way now the question becomes here because pwas are based on browsers and, and can run in the browsers it also aligns to making sure that edge is really good that edge and chrome and and firefox and safari and all these guys are kind of keeping up the standards uh or following the standards which could be tricky because as we've already seen that chrome is kind of going off in its own direction if they take pwas in a different direction on their own platform we could have some splits and so there, there's a lot of unknowns right now but we're starting to see the genesis of this and it's all going to start happening for microsoft and redstone 4 and this is going to bring apps in and i i can't get i can't stress enough guys that people want windows 10 mobile back or want windows mobile back this is the path to doing it it's not through uwp it's not through win32 it is through a pwa app that microsoft could eventually get back into that space in the long term if they decide to invest that money but it's not going to happen until pwas are very mature and Microsoft would do it in a much more um, constrained manner if they do. Like, they're not going to launch 55 phones like they were doing with Nokia every other month. But, um, yeah. So that is a very bold step for Microsoft. And the reason why I say it's bold is, again, because in theory, if everybody's writing PWAs, you don't need Windows desktop so much. You really don't. But, but on the other side, enterprises are not going to move away from Windows because they need Active Directory. They need that security layer. Um, it, at least not in the short term, right? Long term, things will change and things will move to the cloud and, and things like that are kind of going crazy. Um, but it also, at the same time, also kind of makes Chrome OS a little bit more viable option. If Chrome OS supports PWAs in its true nature, then Chrome OS actually becomes more viable. But it does miss that underlying infrastructure that Windows has in the corporate world. And let's be honest, that's where Microsoft makes most of its money is in the corporate world. And so uh, even though the Windows revenue is relatively flat or sometimes shrinking, um, it's not the future of Microsoft, right? The future of Microsoft is the enterprise and all that. And whether, if PWAs sit there, it's it's a good thing for Microsoft at the end of the day. I can't I can't stress that. Um, I've probably said that seven times, but just keep that in mind. I, I, I'm very optimistic. Uh, somebody asked uh, when Redstone 4 is going to be released. So it's supposed to be released um, next month, or I should say it's supposed to be completed next month. Right now, we've done a couple, or Microsoft has had a couple bug bashes. That is the just about second to end, last phase of development. But we should see um, candidate builds here in the next, at, at the earliest, probably two weeks, at the longest in the next four weeks, I would say. Uh, so somewhere between that, they're going to start signing off on this stuff, and then it's going to come out sometime March, uh, but might launch early April, because Microsoft has a tendency to say, hey, it's called 1803, which if you're not familiar, is 18 is the year, 03 is the month, but sometimes it will ship in the following month. It's usually that date is aligned to when it's actually completed. So... We've got that going on. Uh, the other bold move from Microsoft is that uh, Build is going to be uh, May 7th through the 9th, and I'm almost positive I will be there for that. Uh, the reason why I say this is a bold move is Microsoft, I bet, has known about this date for some time. They have contracts in place for the, the Seattle um, Conference Center where they had it last year. They knew it was going to be in Seattle. And then Google came out and said, hey, we're going to have I.O. May 8th through the 10th. So as you can see here, from the 7th through the 10th, uh, Microsoft is having a conference, and so is Google. You know, I, th those dates overlap a little bit, but it's kind of a bold move for Microsoft to be going head-to-head -head with Google. Uh, last year, Build sold out incredibly quickly, and it'll be interesting to see how it does this year, because it, let's be honest, folks. People go to development conference, yes, is, yes, to learn things, but a lot of them look at it as kind of like a half-assed way to get out of work, right? It's like, ah, I could go to Seattle uh, for Build, or I could go to I.O. for Google. And you can make a, an enterprise or a corporate pitch for both because you can get, say, hey, we're going to Google's I.O. to learn how to build better mobile apps for our company. Or you can say we're going to Microsoft because we're learning how to build better cloud apps and desktop apps. Uh, you can go to either one, and but you can only go to one. There's no way you, you can go to both. Uh, it's going to be interesting for press to try to go to both, which I don't think will happen. It's going to stress, put a little bit of stress on some organizations. But um, yeah, so they've got those two conferences as overlapping which is going to be interesting. The other thing, I, I don't know why Microsoft waited to announce this so late. They could announce this. When I went back and looked at the previous announcements, they were all in December for the dates. And then they waited until what? 
uh, February 8th to make their announcement. I don't, I don't understand what the logic was for waiting for so long. Um, and then Google came out and said, hey, we're doing it here because we don't know what Microsoft is. Not that I would expect Google to change theirs. They have no problem filling their seats. And we'll see if Microsoft has any problems filling theirs. But uh, it should be interesting. It's going to be kind of a battle of tech news. It's going to be a crazy week. Um, but, uh, we, you know, we got some time to prep for that a little bit. Actually, I've got – it's going to be kind of nuts for me. So I'm going to go to my, go to Seattle 7th through the 9th, give or take a couple days on both sides. And then the following week, I've got to be in Chicago. Uh, May is going to be kind of a rough month in my life. But um, there we go. Oh, other things that happened this week. Microsoft pushed out uh, Windows 10 17 – 17093, a new game bar, which I reported earlier. I actually even think I showed that off here. Some advanced GPU. Uh, the biggest thing to know is that Windows Defender option is being changed. It's calling Windows Security now, which I think makes a little bit more sense. It's easier to understand, I guess. And it's now in the settings app. So if you're looking for that, um, that's where you kind of have to go to control things and improve Bluetooth pairing. And we've got Microsoft Edge updates. Edges. Edge is coming along, but it's still not there. Um, obviously, there's no sets. There's no cloud clipboard. Um, yeah. I haven't heard too much about Timeline either. I'm assuming that's going to be in this release. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> I if, if Timeline doesn't show up for everybody on release, that will be nuts. I think it will, but I, I, I don't know for certain off the top of my head if that's actually coming. Uh, one other thing I, I do want to point out here. So Google, uh, I don't think Google announced this, but it came from a report that says uh, Google is working on a game streaming service called Yeti. This is interesting for multiple reasons. One, we know that game streaming does work. It's not great, but it's getting there. Uh, and Google kind of venturing into the gaming market. They do have YouTube gaming where it's kind of a Twitch and Mixer competitor, which I, I'm curious how Mixer is performing for Microsoft. I haven't heard good, bad, or indifferent, but we all know that kind of Twitch is the top the top uh, market for streaming and YouTube obviously has a big in, but people don't go to YouTube to watch live gaming like they do. Uh, like they go to Twitch. Twitch is still one of the greatest, and I shouldn't say greatest, but a very good purchase by Amazon. Although it doesn't fit perfectly into their portfolio. It does kind of fit, but anyways, so Google is apparently getting into this. I fully believe that Microsoft, well, we know Microsoft's been getting into this. They've been trialing it um, back since the bomber days. They showed game streaming off with Halo. I'm going to say it's like Halo three uh, at a com company wide meeting. But, um, yeah, so we have that going on. I'll be curious to see what Microsoft is doing here because they have their Game Pass, and I have to think the Game Pass is the genesis of their upcoming streaming service. This is getting people into the platform, and uh, now Google is going to be going into that, and, and good luck to them. You know, the better, uh, the more competing services there are, uh, the better off we are. Uh, although I do tend to think that the biggest loser or biggest Per, the biggest company that has uh, a challenge here is going to be PlayStation because they don't have cloud. They don't have that offshore infrastructure from the local hardware, although they do have a lot of great gaming titles. I'll be curious to see how the PlayStation evolves. Um, very diehard fan base, which is great. I don't want the PlayStation to go anywhere. We need The Xbox needs the competition. But at the same time, um, they don't have some of the back-end tech that, say, Microsoft does uh, because of Azure or what... Um, what Google does because of their Google Cloud and just to be honest, their search infrastructure. So uh, that's kind of a quick rundown of the nutshell of what is going on this week. Got a good, uh, good bunch of good bunch of questions. Excellent English, Brad, uh, going on this week. And so let's let me refresh the page here because I know some came in late. We oh, yeah, had quite a few did. All right. So detective. Oh, let me make sure this is uh, gonna not pop or anything. All right. Detective uh, Polar Polar Font. Detective Polar Font. Yeah. This do WPA scale well? Since they use the browser scaling, if they do, would you prefer? Would you prefer? Would be perfect for smaller mobile devices. Um, they this. So do they scale perfectly? That's I believe more up to the developer than anything else. But yes, they do scale very well. It's just kind of like a web page wrapped in a browser. Although you can do some web assembly and, there, and there's more powerful features that you can unlock, if you will. I know that's not the correct terminology, but creating a true PWA. Um, but yes, they do scale uh, significantly better than, say, a traditional application. Uh, Brandon asks, he says, last minute entry, can I cast from my Moto G to a Vizio soundbar? Uh, oh, he says, currently I cast from a Moto G to a Vizio soundbar and I need to get a new, need to get new PC speakers. Any advice on what the best way to cast them both simultaneously? So, okay, so it sounds like he's casting from his Moto G 
and he wants to get new PC speakers. I, well, let me let me qualify or say something. Whatever speakers you get for your PC, if you want true PC speakers, do not get Sonos speakers. They are not good PC speakers. They are great home audio and home theater and just general smart speakers, but they are not good PC speakers. So do not get Sonos speakers uh, for this instance. Anyway, uh, so he wants to cast to his Vizio soundbar and get new speakers. So... This this is a tough one because I, I don't know what you want to cast. If it's music, you can try to use something like Spotify, and, and I don't know if you can group two different speakers like that because I currently cast uh, Spotify to my Sonos, which works fine for my home audio, but it, it's ter- you can't do it for, like, say, if you're watching a YouTube video because there's a, there's a lag. And so here here's something that may work that you might want to look into. Since you're already using Android, uh, Android with Chromecast might be your best thing. If you can hook a Chromecast up to your soundbar and then go get PC speakers that have a line in on them as well and get a Chromecast audio, then in Android you can group those things and actually um, you can actually uh, cast to both. That might be your best way. I don't know if there's a more cost-effective way to do it, but Chromecast audio is great. If you guys have never used it before, I highly recommend it if you have a bunch of speakers that you want to get uh, add streaming capabilities to. They're relatively inexpensive too. Just check Amazon. Don't buy them direct from like Best Buy or anything else and you can get better better stuff. Uh, Mary Jo asks, he says, are you taking... Yeah, this is um, Miss Mary Jo Foley. Uh, thank you for this, Mary Jo, for your question. Uh, if anybody has not seen it yet, Paul, I, I, I'm not an artist. I can't draw for anything. I can write my name. I can write very well. Um, but I can't draw. And I drew a horrific pig that Paul got a hold of and has been tweeting out at my public shaming. And so, no, Mary Jo, I am not taking any art classes. But thank you for uh, inquiring about that. Um, <laughs> Jesus, Mary Jo, I didn't realize you were a troll. Uh HRL and GRV asks, he says, you and Paul have both post, post oh, good question. Uh, actually, I read this one previously. Uh, you or Paul have posted pictures of your daughter using your Surface Studio. Uh, yeah, but what does she act, oh, sorry, uh, Surface Studio. I don't think Paul's ever posted pictures of his daughter using my studio is why I was hesitating there. But my daughter has definitely drilled on that thing. She's done it multiple times. But what does she usually use? Do you... Do your local public schools use Chromebooks? If so, how do you feel about that? Okay, so a couple, couple. this is a much deeper topic um, for whatever reason. So um, does what does she use at public school? So currently she's in pre-K and they don't use computers at all. They have computers in the room and they might, you know, use them to watch uh, like documentaries on YouTube or something like that. But they don't really interact. She's not into typing. She's not into that phase yet in the schooling. Uh, and very candidly, what does she use at home? She uses nothing at home. Now, granted, this is much easier to say because we only have one child, but our daughter doesn't use iPads. She doesn't use cell phones. Uh, the closest technology that she really knows right now is Apple TV because that's what we use for Netflix and Hulu. Um, but we are a very analog family. We try to keep it that way only because, and we're not trying to like deprive her of this stuff. I don't want it to come off as that way. Only because we know that once we go down that route of her being able to use an iPad or being able to use a cell phone on her own or being able to use a laptop, there's no going back. You know, you never go back from from that stage. You know, while we can try to put restrictions on that, there's no going back. I mean, this is what my daughter did last night. She, she colored. Like, this is... So we don't, she, yes, I know she's used that, but it's not something she uses on a daily or even weekly basis. We are very restrictive in that. Like when we went out to dinner last night, cause my wife is traveling this weekend. Um, she colored like on the paper, you know, they give you those kid mats that have like the letters and you circle them and you write words and that kind of stuff. So we, that's just a choice my wife and I made, um, for better, for worse, you know, she's pretty shielded from technology at this point, but we know that, uh, D day is coming. Um, she'll start kindergarten next year. And I know that at that point, she'll start getting more into computers and iPads. And at that point, then we will step up and, and, you know, start letting her explore that type of world back home once she gets used to it at school. But we, we've, we've tried to keep her away from that as long as we could. And, but, um, yeah, so that's just kind of a, a family or child raising philosophy, I guess, if you will. Uh, Usman asks, he says, any words on HoloLens V2 or V3 this year, or is that 2019 target due to relying on development timescales with WinCore OS? Uh, I very much believe we will see uh, HoloLens V2 this year in some capacity, or V2, V3, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I should say, I believe we will see next-gen HoloLens-type stuff this year. Now, uh, 
I believe that because if they're going to launch in 2019, um, they have to get they have to get the hardware out to developers this year so they can start developing and building proper applications for it and building out that ecosystem so you don't launch with nothing. Um, so it would not surprise me. Actually, I don't even want to say not surprise me. I have good indicators to believe that we will see that stuff happen this year. When exactly this year? I don't know. Um, build maybe that might be a bit early but they, they're they working on hololens v2 v3 they've been working on it for well over a year actually even longer than that probably about two and two and a half years ish i would bet uh, we know it's all being done in house i've already written all i wrote about that stuff well about a year ago actually um so it, will we see next gen hololens this year i honestly think we will I, I would be surprised if we don't at this point knowing what i've the, the whispers around the redmond campus uh, my, oh Jesus, M, my Joka, my Joka, I'm sure I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, as a web-based developer and fan of Microsoft, the Progressive Web App Initiative is a win-win. Last build when they uh, announced Fluent Design for the platform, they also announced a version for the web. However, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, it's restricted to Microsoft internally and partners. Have you heard anything new on this front? Google already has V1 and material design and an SV2. It seems like a lost opportunity of attracting web developers and appear fans. Um, da, 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 da. So somebody, Daily, Dolly Isaac says, I think you're thinking of what's called getmwf.com, which seems to be just for Microsoft. However, there is Office UI Fabric, which is open source. Um, I, I haven't heard too much about what they're doing with the web. To be honest, Microsoft's web presence has been so anemically slow, like Outlook took forever to get updated. And I think that Outlook.com needs to become a progressive web app, specifically their calendar needs to become a progressive web app. And I believe that is taking priority over their Fluent Design uh, because Fluent Design is great, but it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. It doesn't add any functionality. It's not expanding market share for the company. Um, Fluent Design is primarily right now stuck to the desktop. I'll be curious to see if they bring it to the web in any meaningful way. But to your point, they really haven't done it, say, on Windows very well or on, uh, on their own web properties. So Dr. Watashi says... Uh, what's Microsoft planning with my people? This is a great one. It was a major feature focus in the fall creators update, but it's not getting any love. It seems like WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Yammer, and apps hooking into it would be a major booster feature, which has a lot of potential. So you're not wrong. That does have a lot of potential, but the problem is they have to get uh, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and well, they could get Teams and Yammer to hook in, um, but they, those third parties have to do it themselves. I don't think Microsoft can do that for them. And so it is a little odd that my people has just been saying, I turned it off, I don't use it. Um, I understand why people do, but I am not one of those people. Ironically, I didn't mean to say my people there, but it just came out. And that's just kind of the way it works. I, I wish I had some definitive roadmap about, about what is going on with my people and all that other good stuff, but yeah. A lot of good stuff happening in the check, guys. Really appreciate that. Uh, Technical Flow asks, he says, what? What screensaver is this? And so this is not embarrassing or whatever, but maybe it's embarrassing for Apple. But this is the Apple TV screensaver. Uh, if you just Google it, somebody was able to rip it and it actually updates just like the Apple TV app. It's great. I mean, as you can see, it's a nice, it's almost like a drone flying, um, very slow, very high frame rate. I would guess like at least 60 frames per second. And it's beautiful. And it's perfect for background for podcasts like this because um, while it's dynamic, it's not totally distracting. The worst thing is, is that it turns to black uh, when it's scene changing. I don't know why it does that. I haven't been able to figure it out, but that's just kind of what it does. But um, yeah, you can definitely go do that. But um, I think that about wraps it up today, guys. I don't like to drag these things on too long. I try to keep it to, uh, well, we're at 29 minutes. We do, I do about 30 to 35 minutes uh, just about every Friday. If you're new to the show, definitely hit that subscribe button. Uh, oh, I, I was going to do a joke. Here, let me see if I can get it to show up on this on this little uh, guy. It turns off, the battery is very bad. Actually, here is the charger, by the way. So I don't know if this is like the official charger by any means, um, but it's like a little magnet thing. And then it clips on to like the back here, but it doesn't stay very well. Like it, it's very, if I get my fat fingers, like it's very loose. And um, it has to be positioned ever so perfectly. All right, let's see if I can get this thing to turn on. Because I was going to do a please subscribe joke. Um, so if you hit the workouts button, you can see here it says, we can see the lighting. Come on, come on. It says, please subscribe. Uh, <laughs> although, one thing you can see, man, I miss that. You can see a little back arrow up there. That's very like Windows phone. 
esque, very metro esque. That I, I miss some of that. That I don't want to say modern design language because it's metro design language. Um, I did. I want to find the bands for this thing, like the actual wristbands, so I could actually wear it one day. Because I do, I do quite like it. It's a sad, it's a sad, sad thing that this is uh, going away. But uh, all right, guys, that does it for today. Um, have yourselves a wonderful weekend. I'll be back here, right back here next time. I was in New York this week, earlier this week, hanging out with Paul and some of our uh, um, execs, uh, kind of aligning some things for Throt and Petri, which, you know, good stuff. We'll have more about that later. And next week, I'm all back home. I will hopefully get a re review up of this thing. This thing right here is an Amazon Echo speaker from the UK. And they sent it over because they know how much I love that stuff. And I will, uh, I'm going to be curious to see how it sounds compared to, say, the Sonos. Uh, one because I did buy I did buy two of those. So have yourselves a wonderful weekend. We'll catch you right back here next time on the Sam's Report.